I probably won't wondering why this is in the middle of a meteor talk, but uh, as we say, I was visiting this weekend, so it's a chance to just promote uh, occultations. And we use quite a bit of the similar gear that you use for meteors, being transient events. So uh, let's see if I can sell the subject to, to you. <laughs> so we're all familiar with lunar occultations and uh, the moon ambling through the night sky covers up the stars, its proceed leading end proceeding there covers the star and up to about an hour later it reappears at the far side and I do a lot of work on that but uh, we're not discussing that uh, today. But likewise all the small bodies in the solar system, the asteroids, they also cover stars although it's quite infrequent because of their tiny uh, size projected on the skies. It's like one speck of dust trying to cover another speck of dust exactly central. So the geometry of the event is a nice uh, schematic of this occultation taking place and you've got the star let's just say essentially at infinity projecting more or less parallel rays down to the earth like a, sol like a solar eclipse diagram. The asteroid gets in the way, its silhouette is projected onto the earth which is the shadow of the starlight, projects the shadow of the asteroid onto the Earth as it sweeps across. There will be some observers to the north or to the south who do not see the star blink out. Others will see it at the top and the bottom end, they'll see a small amount and then those in the middle will see the greatest duration and if always events can be timed accurately, they can be recombined and normalized and they give us a profile of the asteroid. So we can get the dimensions of the body. If there's enough of them we get a shape profile and also we get high quality astrometry of where the asteroid was because it's practically sharing the same spot in the sky as the star. So what do I use? You can use like a three or four inch uh, refractor but I have my uh, Celestron 11 and a Watek 910 which we've discussed uh, quite a bit. In this case what I do, I don't even run it at 50 frames per second, 50 fields per second unless the star is very bright. Um, it has integration modes so I will use a third of a second or quarter per second, 0 0.16, 0 0.32, 0 0.64 second integration so I can get down to the object about 13 or 14. That's balanced with the, uh, the predicted duration of the event might only be one or two seconds and then you need a good signal to noise ratio of this faint star so it's always a little bit of a, a trade-off. You could only use, use a Watek Ultimate which is fixed at about, uh, they are your 25 frames per second. <laughs> to get the time onto the analog video I have a IOTA VTI, IOTA's video time inserter. All the models are available so there's a GX GPS box sprite. With the Arduino project you can put one together for a few tens of euros. <laughs> and my colleagues in Germany also assemble GPS receivers at relatively low cost. It's recorded, recorded to the laptop via a USB grubber but you could have a video card in a, in a PC no problem. And I use virtual dub or these days OcuRec which is free software for recording the event. In certain other cases I've used my digital CMOS camera which has a 12 or if it's about 12 bit well depth for more detail in the light curve where I've had it's been a planetary occultation event and in this case there's no video time embedded into the video signal what we do is we use the uh, computer clock 
So default windows is not reliable. So we, some use dimension four like you have for your meteor work. The better solution is uh, there's Mindberg NTP, which is free software from an atomic clock manufacturer. And you can also configure your own NTP settings on a computer uh, to get the, the timing. And for recording, there's good software, free or relatively inexpensive, like Fire Capture or Sharp Cap. And people are going this way who don't want to do with uh, analog video cameras and video time inserters. As Tim Haynes, the coordinator in the BAA for Lunar and Asteroid Occultations Assistant Director, he says, well, there's an army of webcam cams out there that are redundant because the major planets are skimming the horizon as they pass along the ecliptic. Uh, most of us can't see Mars or Saturn at the moment. So why not get them employed looking at occultations? But uh, you just have to do enough checks that make sure that the timestamps you have, what are the uncertainties there? Because NTP can be very good. Like fire capture, I tried different versions and I videoed the one pulse per second, very precise LED on my time inserter. One version of fire capture wrote its timestamps were taken at the start of the exposure. In another version, the timestamp was taken at the end of the exposure. And if you're monitoring an event of 0.16 or 0.32 second exposure, and then sending your data in for a shape analysis. The coordinators need confidence of the error and uncertainty of your work. But don't worry about that at the moment, it's just a background info. And also some skilled amateurs have used a drift scan CCD where, where they, they monitor the object, they turn off the tracking on the, star, on the, on the scope, it drifts through the field of view, they get a trail, and where there's a gap in the trail is where the occultation occurred. And Scanalyzer can be used for that. So here's just a sample occultation. Oh, it's gone. So this was a... So here's just a sample occultation. Oh, it's gone. So this was a... Uh, 10.8 mag uh, star being occulted by mag 13 asteroid. There we are, duration 3.76 seconds. Uh, analyze it with uh, occult software by Dave Herald in Australia. He has an analysis module in the free software. Analyzes the light curve. We can see the drop, instantaneous drop, because the asteroid doesn't have an atmosphere. 3.76 seconds and back. Gives an analysis of the disappearance time and reappearance time. Ah, UTC of that to 10 for a hundredth of a second and an uncertainty. But how do we get the predictions of these events? So within our European group, well it's a worldwide collaboration really, so all this Brexit, to, 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 to we astronomers it's irrelevant because we all work together. Science has no boundaries and borders and, and limits. So the best predictions going are by Steve Preston in the USA. But Dave Harold's occult software will also generate quite good level. And these are used by John Talbot in UK, Carlos in Spain for predictions around uh, the Iberian Peninsula and the British Isles. Many of these are, these are prediction feeds. And there's a, a cult watcher by Risto Pavlov, who's now moved to the UK. This coordinates them all, and you, you get your nice list of predictions all in one go. We have report forms, which we can complete. They're emailed to a planner cult list server. And then, if the data is accepted, it's maintained in the database by Eric Frapper 
in France. And I don't look into the detail really, but that's a call to watch a page. Lots of the predictions coming down. The one highlighted was of asteroid Electra. And there's the time, local time, when it will occur and the magnitude drop. If you do a right click on there, it opens up C2A, uh, night sky, planetarium software, and we, we, it will give us the RA and deck of the event and oh, mountains of information. But what we have here is, I, I'm colorblind, so please forgive me, but this sort of bluey turquoisey thing it, it is the predicted track width of the, uh, the main shadow of the body and this sort of pinky red thing this is the one sigma uncertainty in the prediction and then the other, the other marker points verticals are two sigma three sigma and so you get a prediction like this so that there's a track coming up this way across Britain and Ireland with all the times and details of it we had quite a lot of observers log their interest in occult watcher. You can log your station. And it's a wonderful client server system. So these code numbers are all these observers from all over Europe. Uh, the blue lines denote the main width of the track. These other lines are the uncertainties. Here's Tim and his fellow observers in the southern England. I wasn't successful, but many of them were. And Tim got a nice light curve here, so you can see it's a long duration one. Well, it's at 15 seconds though, so it's rare to have one of that duration. They were all then submitted to plan a cult mailing list. Eric checks them and then if accepted they appear in the Eurasta database. So there's everybody's name, rank and number and uh, time of the start, time of the end of the event. They Latin long, they two letter code for their nationality. And combining them, like I said, it's a silhouette moving over the earth. So from their timings we get this shape profile. And so from all these list of observers who were successful, we have these chords. And we, we can't read it, or I can't read it, but uh, at the top is the estimate from there of the dimensions of the body. And here's one we made earlier, which was uh, Sapienta in 2015. This was totally from UK observers. So someone here has got Edens in the Netherlands. He did not get an occultation, he got a miss. But it's still a valuable observation because it delimits this uh, southern edge of the body. Now linked in with the occultation chords that we do, there's quite a bit of work with professional co collaboration. And Joseph Jurek in Prague, <coughs> they work on obtaining <coughs> light curves uh, from asteroids at different phase angles through, through their different uh, oppositions. And there's a very clever matrix algebra, algebra mathematical inversion where they take, they combine all these light curves. One of the leaders is Professor Kasilainen in Finland. And by jiggery pokery, what it produces is an outline uh, of the body. This is asteroid Aspasia. Six different observations of it. The lines across, like here, are the occultation chords. But the, the, the dark outline is one solution of the mathematical inversion, but the, the faint dotted line is the second solution for the mathematics, and they want to know which one is correct. 
So by overlaying the amateur's occultation chords here, we were saying that uh, it really seems as if this solution is the one and not the other. Now bringing this up to date with the latest work from Tony Santana Ross in Poland, with the wonderful Gaia satellite which is doing this marvellous astrometry giving us the greatest ever accuracy for a star catalogue. There's a Gaia GOSA project, the ground-based observation service. So if you like doing a, uh, photometry of asteroids, this project combines your photometry with Gaia's photometry which it does occasionally as it spins across the asteroid paths and combines it with our occultation cords. So there's a Gaia GOSA website and for example they publish work like this. So one of the uh, very active contributors is uh, Adrian Jones who lives in southeastern England not far from Tim Haynes and he and others do these very nicely accurate photometry of the body and as I say, these are combined with multi-year results. The mathematics produces a shape model. And you get uh, something of this result. They have extended not just the outline that I showed with the, the solid line and the dotted line. The mathematics has been extended now that, that it pr produces a convex model, uh, a shape to the body and the lines across are our timing cords. Uh, so our work is helping to re refine the mathematics because here somebody got a short cord but the math says the uh, body is still a solid shape there and two people here got a complete miss. But it, really is on the edge of, of where the asteroid would be. Another nice one, Antigone. <coughs> and I showed the Electra success early on. Many European chords on that one. <coughs> when it came to the mapping it against the, uh, the shape model, all around here it seems a very good fit but along here and many of these points are by very experienced occultation timers so we have confidence in them but this is not a good fit at all and it might be that there's still some work to be done on the mathematics of the modeling or it might be what they've got as the the spin rotation period of the asteroid isn't quite on and if the asteroid had just turned another, who knows, another hour, it might have uh, fit in okay. But that's up to them to, uh, to work through. I'll just say that, yes, if you have zillions of dollars and can set up the European Southern Observatory <laughs> and put adaptive optics and super speckle interferometers onto 8 metre telescopes, then you get that outline of Electra. <laughs> compared with the, what you get from back garden work but also that there's two of the moons because some of these asteroids have moons. <coughs> uh, high quality astrometry, well, well how, how do you get that? With the Gaia satellite giving us very accurate positions of the stars what they do now is we know the occultation occurred so it must be that the uncertainty here can only be like uh, up to the radius of the body and from previous occultation work and from the WISE satellite and all sorts of professional studies they have a good idea of the diameter of the bodies and so an estimate can be made of the uncertainties here and so periodically through the year Dave Harold and others 
they submit a whole set of astrometry to the Minor Planet Centre and they're not given your observatory code like, like mine Z92 my MPC code they compute it geocentrically for the centre of the Earth and it's given code 244 <coughs> So this is one that I got. This is the shortest I got. This is uh, so. This is one that I got. This is the shortest I got. This is uh, a Mag 20 asteroid occulting a uh, a Mag 9 star. That's it, and it goes for a third of a second. What frame rate were you using for that? Well, because the star was bright, I could run it like our video rate, our meteor rate, at 25 frames a second. 50 fields per second. You get this, and so there's about 16 or 17 data points where it disappeared and then came back. <clears throat> but the, the coordinators, what they can do with that is they've got, that's the year, month and day, and because of the accurate timing, We've got this ridiculous uncertainty on the, the time, the day. As I say, it's computed for geocentric position. So they then measured the arc second displacement from the star and the asteroid from middle of Earth to that. And then they mix up their units and say the uncertainty is 2.4 million arc seconds. And then the position angle bet between the two. And even better was a UK one where these four observers produce these chords. We've got a shape model as well of the body. They can assume that that's the centre point of it. Uh, so yet again, there's this incredibly tiny uncertainty there. And in 0.6 milli arc seconds, so it was 60, 10,000 of, of a second. So these are submitted to the Minor Planet Center. I think some of you have done uh, astrometry to the MPC. And so you see that uh, that first event that I recorded, the Minor Planet Center extends its uh, precision in its uh, data set. So the date is extended by another decimal place, as is the RA, as is the declination. But you okay, you whether you want to be honoured or not, your name appears in, in the submitters to the Minor Planet Centre circulars, but uh, your observatory isn't, it's just 244, the special geocentric observation, and that's the multiple UK one. And these are used, if the MPC have confidence in them, these are used as kind of anchor points for the orbits, because periodically they, they will revise the orbits of these bodies. And they're revising all these anyway as more data comes through from Gaia's data releases. <coughs> uh, you mentioned IOTA ES, there's a worldwide campaign with uh, Professor Bruno Sicardi in Paris, who leads a pro-am pro range of projects to observe bodies in the outer solar system with universities in Rio, do some great astrometry with their big telescopes. Uh, Granada, uh, amateurs with Volcan Bajgir and my pals. Uh, there's a Project Lucky Star website, and this is meant to be the Lucky Star that, uh, that gets covered up by one of these outer solar system bodies, and from it we can get this size, shape, dimensions. <coughs> They've discovered rings of one or two of the centaur bodies have ring systems, <coughs> rather like uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus do. <coughs> and uh, they, they investigate the atmospheres of the outer bodies. There's a website where you can call up the predictions, but you don't need to do all that because it feeds into Occult Watcher, and so you can see them pop up on, on your screen. But uh, one that we really pushed for last October was Triton was uh, occulting a Mag 12.4 star 
and uh, this is Bruno's slide that uh, it would give us information from there was no the last really good info was 10 or more years ago on Triton <coughs> any work you get any light curves this will give us information on light uh, the atmospheric pressure winds structure of its atmosphere and this was a provisional width of the shadow track So what we're looking out for as well, if you were near the centre line the light curve would drop, it wouldn't be instantaneous, it would fade because of Pluto's atmosphere, or in this case Triton's atmosphere and if you were central, bang on the centre line there'd be a little flash, there'd be a flare as the star's light is refracted through the atmosphere of Pluto, or in this case Triton and shoots out towards you <coughs> That's just comparing a professional and an amateur light curve. So the first prediction was this band across here, favourable for us. The Gaia team released 100 stars for pre-release from their catalogue to give us the, light, the slight shift in the track. The Sophia Airborne Observatory was going to look for it, but uh, I'm not sure how successful they were along the centre line. Uh, it's gone quiet a bit on the, what they did. But no worries, the, the back garden crew were out. And here's their light curves. So, yeah, they, they, in many cases, the, the upper, upper yellowish is, is a comparison star. Uh, the lower curve is the, uh, the light of the target star, so as Triton covered it up, there's quite a, a drop. It isn't instantaneous. And that will give the professional team uh, information on the, the atmosphere of Triton. Wolfgang and the pals in Portugal were on the centre line, and they got a very clear centre spike. And there's a video now of uh, so the top one is the target star. If you watch, it, it, it fades down, and you think that's the end of it for two or three minutes, but it will flare. It flash there, and that's the you've been absolutely spot on central. The light has refracted through the atmosphere. It tells the physicists what the density is or the clarity of Triton's atmosphere. So the top one is the target. Uh, just for fun, we put our cords in so we could measure the diameter of Triton. <laughs> but it's, it's rather well known, so we're not going to get Nobel Prizes for, for that. Uh, that's the worldwide cords across Triton. Uh, that's my cord up there. I think there's, there's an American one, I think, a bit further north to come through. Here's Portugal and here's Africa. Finishing into the outer solar system, we know that uh, New Horizons flew past Pluto in 2015, but their next target was 2014 MU69, and they had no idea what, what was it, what was it, what size was it. So the predictions came up with a, a track in South America. Pro-Am teams went out with these telescopes with uh, QHY174 cameras, quite expensive uh, video cameras. Uh, the amateurs and professionals were together in the Pampas, and there's a nice story that it was blowing a hooli that day, so the locals came along with trucks, vans, lorries, everything they could to form a windbreak. 
so that they could all uh, stay in the field and get video. And what they got was a miss there and a, and a miss there, but they, they got five chords. But they don't know what is that. Is, is it one elongated blob? Or is it binary? Is that the shape of it? Is it that? Is it like comet, was it 67P? So it will fly by a New Year's Day. Uh, they, they got some other occultation chords a few weeks ago, but being mainly professional, they're sort of sitting on the result for the, for the moment. Uh, we hope they'll let us know soon. <coughs> so to finish, I've gone into a cult watch here to look for any tracks across the island. It's probably rather early to think about having a go, but uh, September 20, unfortunately it's 5.20 in the morning, so it's, that's not sociable for me, but uh, there's a few observers logged the interest in the station. That's the location of the target star in Taurus, uh, quite close to Orion. More magnified view, this is C2A, which is embedded into a cult. Here's the track moving up here. European observers already logged their interest. There's Tim and his pals. And I just temporarily just logged uh, Dunsink into a cult watcher. So the blue lines are the main core predicted track of the event. Uh, quite a high certainty that will be so, but it, it, it usually moves because the, the target star's position is very well known, but the asteroid, there's still uncertainties. So that's the, the path along for that fella. There's another one coming up uh, September 23, uh, Hamburger. This goes down the other way. Now there are these really wide tracks and these are early morning, so, but with the occult walkshire predictions as we get into the autumn there'll be many more coming up uh, across all of Ireland at sociable times as well, like uh, night at night. One thing, we'll be doing the predictions for you for this, so the updates that uh, December 7, that's the shadow track of Cleopatra and it's, it looks like a boot but it's, it's a, they call it the dog bone asteroid, it's quite elongated and it has two moons, it has uh, Alexa Helios and Cleo Cellini and there will be predictions provided for those two moons because they will cause the target star to dip by perhaps a quarter or a third of a second and any observations of those will be of great benefit. Tim Hames has his website stargazer.me.uk you can look on there, he's got call for observations and a Cleopatra page. So to finish, if you want to have a look into background to occultations there's our BAA members pages, that's that a members pages, that's that's Tim's, look out for that. That's mine taken when I was at the uh, National Museum of Scotland. Uh, stargazerme.uk, Tim's site, look at the BAA Asteroid Remote Planet website, there's going on asteroids uh, occultations. Uh, Tim and I are administrators of a UK occultation Yahoo group and there's also the free planet cult list. So I'll leave you with that and uh, just get in touch if, if anything's caught your eye. Sounds fascinating. I know I've been doubting, you know, thinking about it for on and off for a while, but I think I'll uh, yeah. definitely give it a go. You know, well, well, what I should do is Keep a look out on a cult watcher for anything good. Cult watcher for anything good coming along, yes. especially 
at a social time on an evening <laughs> and a wide track with a good probability because uh, some people go for these and they do the high probability ones they do one or two a year and they can have a good chance of success like I do 40 or 50 a year they're low probability and you've got to be a bit committed to do them <laughs> and I get I get four or five successes so we don't want to you don't want to discourage people by yeah, yeah. it's like the major cameras we were saying don't go for all you know the real real high end initially possibly start off simple and bit by bit <laughs> and in terms of the timing um, how useful is it I suppose if you don't have a, a GPS time instructor initially and um, what level of accuracy can you expect by using that atomic clock time server you mentioned? What? Server you mentioned. Well, you, you can. Uh, well, dimension 4 is still good, but, but any kind of N NTP service controlling your computer clock, um, it, it can be uh, much more accurate than a tenth of a second. It can be uh, 100 or a twentieth of a second. It can be very good. Uh, and because if, if that was providing syncing your computer clock and then you use the free fire capture or sharp cap to record it but, but in the early days we had stopwatches for these and people which was really unlikely and they would stare into the eyepiece for 15 minutes with a stopwatch hoping to see one of those gone back so it was purgatory <laughs> but uh, if you you saw there that if something has a duration of say 15 has a duration of say 15 seconds if someone got some kind of recording like with the webcam mm. and a reasonable timing mm. uh, 0 0.1 seconds I'm not going to argue over the that what proportion is, is that over a 15 second chord yeah. you, your observation is going to be worthwhile because you might even be able to do a visual there with yeah. with some means of beeper or, or like the old speaking clock. But even if there was lots of cards and this was one in the middle, it would yes. be immediately obvious if there was a timing error. Well, I didn't put examples on, but sometimes we, we've had people submitting cards mm -hmm. and Eric Frapper, who administers this in France, he puts his raw data up and you can see sometimes one is displaced. Yeah because someone hadn't applied a certain correction or they didn't know what it was and if he can see that there's other, and if he can see that there's other seasoned campaigners uh, I've got it just a, this way he will then document that he's applied that correction and, yeah, and so people's work is, is included so that they're acknowledged and they've made a contribution and then we get to advise them to yeah. help them to, to improve the technique but yeah you, you want people to have a go and not to put them off and say oh you must be uh, you must be atomic clock yeah. Uh, yeah. precise and uh, no but, but I'm one of those people who, who's very occasionally tried this and I've used both the drift scan and the webcam you can get good results for both I mean I, I use an ASI webcam uh, fire capture and the NTP on the laptop I can't remember it was one of the events last year it was quite a Yes. And the call I got, assuming somebody had manually moved it to make it fit. No, um, just, just fit it in. It looked pretty good. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's more people now using like these. Yeah. We're saying these webcams that, that yeah. feel lost and lonely. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking I've, I've upgraded a couple of the uh, watch cameras. I have a couple of uh, the Ultimates, the H2 Ultimates. So, yes. Uh, or Supreme, sorry. But uh, the good use for them. Good use for them, you know, especially uh, yeah, on, on, on your larger telescope and running at uh, 25 frames a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I was wondering, why did you use uh, F3.3 or how would you use that? Oh, the F3.3 It's because with, with the Watek chip, it's really quite small, and on my Celestron 11, it gives you quite a tiny field of view. Oh and uh, you've got to be careful aligning onto the target star but uh, with the reducer I, I can increase the it increases the field and it gives me a, a slightly limiting magnitude 
And so, yeah, I, I gain in that way. Uh, with the with the Celestron 11 and an f3.3 reducer and one of our standard video cameras, it's about half a degree across the diagonal. So, if you have quite a good uh, have quite a good uh, mount with pointing accuracy, you can get it. But uh, if there's any issue with it not being aligned properly, then it, it can really be a challenge to get onto the target field. That's why there's the C2A software is integrated into a cord, and they've now put an add-in for guide software, if you like that, so you can call up the, the, the target star field. And it gives you the, the RAN deck of, of the target star, so you could go to your own preferred planetarium software and look at the field and match the field of view of the video so you know you're on the right spot. So that's why I use the reducer, it gives me more field to, to work with and I can get fainter objects. But people do them with 4-inch refractors and uh, Watek Ultimates. Yes. So give me, I have the, so give me, I have the equipment to be good to give, just give yeah. a shot and see them as well. And of course, like that, you've got to be there at the right place at the right time because... Uh, I don't know if it's at the 3 a.m. I have to say. No. On the rock night especially. But they, the predictions give the uncertainty in the timing. Yeah. And now, as I say, with, we keep saying with Gaia, and the uncertainty in many cases is just a few seconds. Mm. Sure. So you can be ready and uh, it records. Any other questions? But I've, I've, I first tried doing this uh, only once and um, I, I used a DSLR. Yes. No, I, I had to calibrate the clock on the camera yeah. with, um, say, one of these um, wave set. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so you use the DSLR in video mode. Yeah. Recorded the event. <coughs> um, but I had to use it like a red torch. And I had to use it like a red torch and do a flash yeah. to, to indicate the beginning of the, the time. Yeah. Now, it, there must be some human re reflex reaction. Well, it won't be without it. I mean, the other thing I have to cross check, if I have a minute, the other thing I have to cross check my GPS time, because you've synced the GPS receiver, because it can take a while to update its almanac to get the correct time, to get UTC, not GPS time, which, which is a little bit different. Uh, and uh, there can be issues sometimes. So what I do is I have one of these radio control clocks, like a kitchen clock, and I restart it a few minutes before, so it latches on to MSF or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. and gets me the time. And what you could, and then I, I double check that against my GPS to, to have confidence that everything's working. And perhaps with a DSLR you could record the event, keep the video running, and then go video clock. your MSF clock. <coughs> Time, yes. And that's all very well. The phone will be internally knows GPS to a microsecond, but it can be up to that second latest phone. You go, yeah, because. You know, Garmin GPS, um, Garmin GPS receivers, and you know, dedicated GPS receivers, so the actual time displayed on the LCD or the, the screen can be way behind. The yes, LCDs can be slow and sluggish in cold weather, but Tim Hames has had a look in, into all these options with uh, mobile phone timings and. Uh, and a, and a kitchen clock that's radio synced would be give you some confidence, but yeah, but get in touch with us if, if you're interested. I started the video um, with the time on a couple of minutes before, yes, on with the time on my mobile phone, and exactly what, yeah, yeah. it was, it didn't did update the time for about two minutes, so I think I started two minutes later, right. yeah, yeah. 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 Very good. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for that. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for that. Mm -hmm.